Um, hello, everyone. Good morning for those who are uh, far away from Ukraine and <laughs> good evening to those who are closer. My name is Alona Lasheva and I'm editor of Common Journal. Um, and this year, as you know, we organized this huge event, conference, Dialogues of Peripheries, and now we're holding the final event, and we're going to speak about authoritarian regimes and the imperialist aggression. Um, for those who are watching us on YouTube, you can also take part in the discussion by leaving your questions and comments in the chat. Uh, the same applies for those who are, uh, are here with us on Zoom. We have a chat and you can uh, put your questions here. Um, also, um, in the end, I, I might switch to Ukrainian. So if you want to hear the final word of the conference, uh, you can choose the option of interpretation and choose uh, English. Um, so, okay, um, let's um, start um, the panel. When we were planning uh, this conference, um, the background the background idea of it was to bring together people from countries which experience one or the other sort of uh, imperialist aggression. And during these two days, we actually shared a lot of experiences with people who probably are more similar to um, like experiences which are more similar uh, to experiences of Ukrainians. But this panel is a bit different because uh, this panel decided to a bit take a step back probably from all the pain and horror which happen now in uh, our lives and try to understand but where all this came from. How certain regimes develop to a point when they do not only oppress citizens inside of the country, but also decide to start an invasion, occupy, destroy, uh, organize ethnic cleansing, etc. Uh, and that's why we invited uh, our amazing colleagues from uh, uh, who are experts on such countries as Russia, Iran, and Hungary, uh, with whom we're going to try to understand why such regimes occur. And probably in um, in this in this event, we're rather going to think not about um the war itself but about the the long term origins of it um so yeah uh let me introduce our speakers so for first of all it's ilia uh, who is a political theorist and activist um frida um amazing Marxist with whom we already uh, had interview uh, on our journal and um, Chaba, he is a journalist from Hungary who actively uh, now uh, writes on Ukraine and travels uh, to Ukraine quite often. Um, so yeah, let me not take a lot of uh, your time and Ilya, please start. <laughs> Uh, okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for uh, the invitation. Actually, it was a big, bit surprising to be to be the first uh, speaker. Uh, but I I um I want to uh, start my brief talk about the uh, authoritarian or even neo fascist dictatorship uh, in Russia from the um, uh, from the moment of the beginning of this. Um, of the invasion uh, of Ukraine in February uh, 2022, because I think that uh, this uh, moment was uh, crucial uh, for the uh, for the <clears throat> transformation of the regime into new uh, quality. And in this sense, uh, I think what uh, Alena already mentioned this. 
this uh, like interrelation between the uh, external imperialist aggression and uh, the formation of the <clears throat> of the authoritarian regime of the uh, dictatorship is very much clear it's very much visible so uh, it's uh, hard to define in all the story of the formation of uh, and and development of the putin um uh, uh regime it's uh, it's hard to distinct uh, the uh let's say external and internal so if we look back to the history of this uh regime of its uh, formation starting from the early uh, 2000s or uh, even earlier even uh in the <clears throat> uh in the 90s uh we can uh we can see how uh, the uh, experience of the Chechen wars, uh, of the first Chechen war, and then the second Chechen war, which which was started exactly in the moment when uh, Putin came uh, to power uh, in the fall of uh, 1999, uh, how <clears throat> how important it was for the uh, development of this uh, political regime. So basically, if we look uh, to the uh, to this moment, to the moment of um, February of uh, 2022, uh, we can see how in uh, in a week, uh, the first week of uh, invasion, the political regime, which was uh, previously uh, designed more or less as some sort of um, of managed democracy or electoral authoritarianism with some uh, limited uh, space uh, for <clears throat> uh, like freedom of expression. Let's say it was very restricted, but it existed uh, to the last moment before the invasion. Uh, how uh, all of that was, uh, was crashed uh, and uh, how this regime moved to the to the new quality to the of the open uh, dictatorship, uh, where uh, the identity uh, between uh, the <clears throat> let's say <clears throat> uh, support or unconditional support of the war, unconditional support of the of the president of. Uh, like a charismatic leader of the of the nation and the very uh, kind of civic belonging belonging to the uh, to the Russians as a community became uh, like uh, uh, crucial for the construction of the uh, regime. So you have to support Putin, support the war, and that could make you a true member of the of, of, of the community, a true member of the of the society. <clears throat> so up to the uh, to now uh, there, there are more than uh, six hundred political prisoners in Russia, like officially recognized, uh, probably there are much more uh, because uh, starting from February uh, 2022, uh, people were arrested uh, because just because of their uh, open uh, disagreement with this sort of uh, of uh, civic identity that I just uh, I just described. So it means that uh, people openly criticized uh, the war. They distribute some sort of alternative information. So all of that was criminalized. Uh, all the independent media, uh, most liberal independent media that remain uh, to the moment uh, when the war was started were shut down, like uh, during uh, during the week, uh, and uh, the uh, quite strict censorship uh, was implemented, uh, and uh, also uh, some process of uh, ideologization of the sphere of uh, the uh, culture and uh, education was, was started. Uh, 
So up to now, uh, we can say that uh, in most of the uh, of the education, you already have the uh, sort of ideological courses. Uh, for example, uh, in the uh, in the universities, uh, there is the course uh, which uh, called the uh, DNA of Russia. Uh, so DNA uh, of Russia means uh, that uh, there is something. Uh, um, it's 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 a kind of idea of identical between the biological between some sort of unconscious and uh, culture or uh, history as the uh, as the legacy of the Russians that they uh, that, that they share. So uh, so it means that uh, people should uh, remember. Uh, something that is uh, already inherited uh, in their uh, DNA. Uh, and um, <clears throat> this, uh, this means uh, that basically uh, you have the courses uh, that uh, uh, introduce the uh, state, uh, state ideology in um, in the universities, uh, these courses uh, there, um, so you you have to visit it. Uh, you, you have to be there. Uh, also in the uh, in the schools, uh, there are uh, also some kind of ideological bra brain washing. <clears throat> also, hard. so you uh, see the uh, transformation of the uh, of the regime uh, in the sort of the uh, total uh, total state uh, the uh, other question is what was the um, uh, what was the the uh, way towards it so how it uh, it happened uh, as i as i mentioned uh, already uh, in the whole history of the transformation of the putin regime the <clears throat> A relation between the external and uh, uh, internal uh, was always uh, always presented. Uh, uh, so the uh, aggression, the external aggression, the external uh, military uh, uh, military operations that uh, brings. Uh, some sort of unity uh, for the society that brings some peace uh, and social uh, harmony um, inside the country. Uh, this kind of relation became uh, became essential for the uh, regime uh, as such, and also vice versa. Every sort of uh, internal uh, opposition, any sort of uh, social movements any sort of challenges coming uh, from below, coming from the society, uh, were recognized as the uh, inter, uh, intervention of uh, the uh, external uh, external enemies. So were, were uh, immediately recognized as the uh, external, uh, external threats. So uh, in this sense, you can see uh, how to the, um, <clears throat> how the, uh, very clear uh, uh, and very coherent anti-revolutionary uh, line uh, became essential for uh, for this uh, regime, which uh, ex uh, uh, actually uh, extrapolated to the uh, to the history. So, if you uh, listen clearly to the uh, to the speeches of Putin, you can uh, find that this uh, this idea that uh, the uh, revolution was uh, just and everywhere uh, uh, and uh, in any form uh, was a sort of uh, intervention of external uh, forces. Uh, so uh, this kind of explanation used even uh, to uh, to describe uh, the uh, events of the Russian Revolution of 1917, uh, then uh, to describe exactly in the same way uh, the uh, 
protests um, in uh, Russia in uh, 2011, uh, tw 2012, uh, the uh, biggest uh, protests uh, against a regime that uh, ever had, uh, in its history, and of course uh, the uh, events in Ukraine in uh, 2014. So uh, in this sense, you can uh, you can say that the uh, invasion of uh, Ukraine uh, also uh, was a way to prevent uh, this kind of. Uh, challenges for the regime from below uh, in, in Russia. It was a part of this uh, very, um, very coherent, very, um, uh, very clear uh, anti-revolutionary uh, line, uh, which lies in the in, uh, very foundation of, uh, of this regime. Uh, and uh, the last question is, uh, what should be is the uh, the the name for uh, for uh, this regime uh, now, especially after its uh, transformation uh, into the open uh, uh, dictatorship uh, after the beginning <clears throat> after the beginning of invasion, there is a big uh, debates uh, about uh, if we can uh, name it uh, fascism, uh, if it, uh, right way to uh, to do it and uh, i think that um, uh, yes it's 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 it's, it's just uh, just uh, just name uh, of course uh, it's a, a form a new form of uh, fascism a new form of uh, extreme um, repressive authoritarian uh, state uh, that uh, has very little in common uh, with the, let's say, historical uh, fascisms in various European countries uh, in the 30s. So this new fascism was born out of spirit of the uh, neoliberal uh, transformation of the society. Uh, it was born out of atomization of the uh, society, uh, the atomization uh, which uh, produced by the market, by, by, by the market economy, by sort of <clears throat> relations uh, that it uh, uh, bring to uh, society. And, and that's why you can't um, describe uh, this a new form of uh, fascism uh, in terms of uh, mass mobilization. Uh, so, of course, it's not a regime which based on some sort of fascist movement. There is no fascist movement, there is no uh, mobilization, but contrary, uh, you have a deep uh, depolitization, the atmosphere of uh, powerless and uh, fear in the society which create the uh, the base for uh, for this uh, regime and the last thing uh, that I um, I want to say uh, it's uh, that this uh, kind of extreme uh, form of um, extreme form of neoliberal authoritarian capitalism that uh, that you have uh, in um, Russia for now, it's not, uh, uh, it's not something unique. It's uh, not something that uh, came only out of uh, some uh, special path of uh, post-Soviet uh, Russia during uh, last uh, 20 or 30 years but i think uh, that it's uh, uh, <clears throat> it's an acceleration of uh, of neoliberal uh, capitalism that came uh, in russia to some uh, extreme form uh, but uh, also uh, presented in the both presented globally is some sort of tendency so, and even if you look to the, <clears throat> let's say, uh, this Putin's ideology, it's it's very eclectic, uh, and it's uh, it's very kind of secondary in the terms that it coined uh, a lot from the rhetorics of the global uh, far right of the far right in. Um, 
in the US and uh, Europe uh, and so on. So uh, in, in this sense, the uh, Putin's regime uh, for the moment exists as the vanguard of some uh, very dangerous global trend. Ilya, thanks a lot. Um, I do have, of course, a lot of uh, questions, but we will have time for this in the discussion. Just, um, I just wanted to highlight what you said about Russian regime being not something unique, because uh, for us here now in Ukraine, of course, our enemy, like your enemy always looks very special to you, that it's something that, you know, never happened. Uh, but if we take yeah, a bit like step back, the scariest part that it's not something super unique and it might happen again and it might happen in different um, regions as well. So that's why it's really good we are here today to talk about such tendencies which uh, were probably present in Russia before which led to the state in which we're now in different contexts. And um, I want to invite Frida, of course, it's um, on one hand, if we, you know, look for, for, for people who look from more, you know, civilizational perspective, you know, Russia, Iran, different cultures, but here now in Ukraine, we see how, um, you know, different cultures might, be connected in not very way of how Iran also became an ally in war against Ukraine. Um, so, Frida, the floor is yours. Thank you. And in order to save time, I did write out my comments, but then when we get to the Q&A, of course, I'll be more spontaneous. Um, I, will, I will read from prepared comments. So first about the evolution of the regime in, in Iran. The Iranian state needs to be understood as a case of militarized state capitalism acting as a regional imperialist power in the Middle East. In many ways, it has continued the general direction of the economy of the previous Pahlavi regime. That is a statist economy characterized by the unity of industry and the army. Since the 1979 revolution, however, Ayatollah Khomeini and his followers who established the Islamic Republic have used an anti-US imperialist discourse to destroy any progressive and revolutionary opposition to their repression and to co-opt part of the Iranian and global left. And of course, when I say destroy, and I don't mean to ignore the the uprisings that we've had in 2017, 2019, and the Women Life Freedom Movement that I will talk about later in my comments. The extent to which the Iranian regime is against US imperialism is directly related to its own capitalist and Persian Shia nationalist ambitions. Hence, its anti-imperialism is a counter-revolutionary one. After the Iran-Iraq war from 1980 to 1988, as long as oil income was plentiful, this regime spent a portion of its profits on building infrastructure, health, education, and giving benefits to a large part of the working class, so long as they abided by its fundamentalist ideology. However, over time, more and more of the oil income started going toward militarism and military and political interventions in other countries in the region at the expense of the extreme poverty of the masses. 80% of the Iranian economy, which consists mainly of oil and gas, telecommunications and auto production, is under the control of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, which is Iran's de facto military and principal employer. It can be argued that the Ira Ira uh, Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps is Iran's de facto state, it is a force for repressing labor, youth, women, and oppressed minority struggles inside Iran. It also conducts Iran's military interventions 
in Syria, Iraq, and Lebanon, either directly or through its Afghan and Lebanese Hezbollah militias, which are funded by the Iranian state. <clears throat> In 2018, in a public speech, President Rouhani started uh, at, at the time, who was president uh, at the time, not at this point. He stated clearly that Iran's strategic borders are the Indian subcontinent on the east, the Caucasus in the north, the Red Sea in the south, and the Mediterranean in the west. Hence, although Iran is an authoritarian Islamic fundamentalist theocracy, pursuing a Shia, a Shia expansionism, its military interventions in the region have been based both on theocratic adventurism and ambitious and delusional goals concerning future economic benefits. <clears throat> now, as far as the political economy structures that support this regime are concerned and how they're integrated into the global economy, up until the 2018 withdrawal of the US Trump administration from the nuclear agreement with Iran and the imposition of severe sanctions which have destroyed its economy, Iran had the second largest economy in the Middle East uh, after Turkey. It thus saw itself as a contender against Saudi Arabia for control over the region. The Iranian regime still hopes that through a reliance on China and Russia, it will be able to pull itself out of the current crisis and continue to compete as a regional superpower. As an inefficient, and I, I want to emphasize inefficient, militarized, theocratic, state capitalist regime, in which over 80% of the capital is owned and managed by the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps or its contractors, the regime is held to account by no one. Even from a capitalist standpoint, it has been spending an increasingly increasing portion of its oil income on militarist projects that have not yet generated a profit, except most recently with its sales of drones and missiles to Russia, for use in its genocidal war in Ukraine. That is generating profit for the Iranian regime, I'm, I'm unfortunately. Of the funds acquired through the sale of oil, gas, and petrochemicals, what does not go into military projects is embezzled by the government leaders and their cronies. This leads to a great deal of corruption within the system itself. Thus, Iranians suffer from severe levels of inequality, malnutrition, and more than 60% of the population of 82 million live under the poverty line. 90% of Iran's 13 million workers are contract, contract workers with few rights and benefits. While the official workforce is estimated at 28 million, millions work unofficially without any rights, including millions of women who are not part of the official workforce, but the underground or unofficial workforce. The real unemployment rate is much more than 60%. The current minimum wage is $100 per month for a family of four, which is less every day due to rising inflation and is far below the World Bank's extreme poverty line of $240 a month for a family of four or $2 per, uh, per person per day. So it's far below that. The Iranian government has been trying to find new ways to rebuild its economy through alliances with China and Russia. China's One Belt, One Road initiative seeks to offer Iran a way to circumvent US sanctions, an agreement signed in the fall of 2019 based on this project was to provide Iran with a $400 billion investment in oil, gas, and other infrastructure development and 5,000 Chinese security forces to be deployed as security guards in exchange for Iranian oil, gas, and petrochemicals at a 30% discount. And Chinese security forces really means 
Chinese soldiers on Iranian territory. Both parties committed to the deal for 25 years with a boost in Chinese investments every five years. Iran is now also part of the expanded uh, BRICS, the Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa economic agreement and, and alliance that has now ex uh, in, uh, added eight more members since uh, this, uh, uh, earlier this fall, or I'm sorry, in, in, uh, the late summer. For decades, the regime has been using Iranian nationalism to promote its military interventions and programs as a source of honor and strength. This can help explain why up until 2017, when there was an uprising, most Iran Iranians were quiet about Iran's military interventions and its nuclear and missile programs. Now, however, given the dire economic situation in the country, the brutal repression of the 2017 and 2019 protests and the 2022 Women Life Freedom Movement and the experience of the COVID-19 pandemic, which was deadly for Iranians and killed many, many, uh, the numbers were not even counted. After all of this, most Iranians have realized that they're being robbed to pay for wars, arms, and dangerous nuclear and missile programs that have brought the country to the point of economic collapse also feeling more sympathy for the people of the region and Ukrainians who have suffered from Iran's military and political interventions. Now, uh, concerning authoritarian regimes and wars and why they are interconnected. One. It can be argued that capitalism in its essence is authoritarian. If we begin with Karl Marx's Capital and his Economic and Philosophical Manuscripts of 1844, we learn that capitalism is not simply an unjust mode of distribution. It is a mode of production based on alienated labor, an extreme mental and manual division of labor that turns work into a meaningless, undifferentiated, monotonous activity and turns the human being into a cog in a machine. Capitalist labor alienates us not only from the products of our labor, but also from our potential for free and conscious activity and from other human beings. Based on Marx's capital, we can sum up the logic of capital in the following way that alienated labor, which is not limited to factory or manufacturing labor, produces value and leads to a system in which the goal becomes the expansion of value as an end in itself. To meet this goal, capitalism introduces more and more machinery and technology to increase labor productivity and extract more and more surplus value from human or living labor. This process also leads to the concentration and centralization of capital in fewer hands to the point where a, in a single country, capital could even be accumulated in the hands of a single capitalist or a single capitalist corporation. At the same time, this process leads to an imbalance for capitalism itself. Relatively more and more technology and machines are used at the expense of living human labor, which is the only source of value. This imbalance leads both to an increasing rate of unemployment relative to investment and a tendency toward a decline in the rate of profit and periodic economic crises. And these crises can lead to war between competing capitalist entities or states. So right there, you have the connection between the capitalist mode of production and war, global competition and war. Even without an outright war, in order to overcome crises, capitalism needs to resort to more and more <clears throat> authoritarian means, physically and ideologically, to extract more surplus value from labor and to quell the dissatisfied unemployed. These means can be seen in the use of slave labor, 
a prison industrial complex, more policing, and in general, greater militarization of society in life and in thought. However, there is more to why capitalism leads to authoritarianism. The logic of capital also promotes authoritarianism by devaluing critical and independent thinking and encouraging narrow self-interest and selfishness. So these are all the reasons that I wanted to single out about the connection between capitalism, uh, accumulation, alienation, global competition, war. And of course, I mean, from Marx's standpoint, um, Marx thought that by bringing workers together uh, capitalism would create the conditions for national and international solidarity among them to uproot the system and to replace it with a humanist alternative. At the same time, he was not, he was not an unrealistic person. He realized as a Hegelian dialectical philosopher that reality develops in contradictory ways and uh, not everything is predictable and that not everything fits into a pattern, that capitalism can be very resilient and that racism, sexism, intra-class divisions and ideological conditioning are also used to divide the working class and all those who suffer from the ills of capitalism. <clears throat> so do I have five minutes left? Mm -hmm. Three. Three minutes, okay, there you go. So uh, final two questions on the oppressed people and nations inside the regime and those suffering from the imperialist aggression of the regime. Um, <clears throat> what are the perspectives for solidarity and what are the obstacles? So the modern Iranian state has a hostile relationship with provinces in which national minorities, the Kurds, Arabs, and Baluchis and Turkmens have been subjected to much discrimination and oppression and deprived of basic resources. Iran's national minorities are not allowed to use their mother tongue as the language of instruction and administration and most suffer from poverty and state repression. And the regime is deeply afraid of the struggles for self-determination in Iranian Kurdistan in particular. And especially when you consider that the Women Life Freedom Uprising, which emerged in September 2022 against the police murder of a young Kurdish woman, Mahsa Jina Amini, uh, started with large protests in Kurdistan and then continued to mass strikes among Kurds and uh, strikes elsewhere as well. Um, there's also a concern that the regime has about protests in Khuzestan uh, uh, against the uh, ethnic repression and against the repression of Khuzestanis as an, as an ethnic minority and against the environmental, deep, deep environmental problems of pollution <clears throat> caused by, and, and pollution and in general, structural environmental problems caused by the building of dams and the pollution generated by the petrochemical industry. And there are concerns about Baluchistan which is Iran's poorest province and has been the site of continuous protests since the women life freedom movement began. And Baluch women have been issuing powerful feminist statements and challenging the Baluch leadership for being misogynist and having made deals, having occasionally made deals with the Iranian regime and with the Taliban. And then finally, a um, question about whether authoritarian regimes have Achilles heels and where, yes, and these include economic bankruptcy and labor struggles, environmental disasters, opposition from women and non-binary people against misogyny and gender state violence, and opposition from oppressed national and ethnic minorities. The actions of Iranian women and the statements they have issued during the Women Life Freedom Movement last year showed that there is much that people around the world can learn from the current women's struggles in Iran. While Iranian women have not yet succeeded in creating a feminist revolution, they have posed some critical questions and challenges for global feminism. And in the q and I'd be happy to say more about what I mean by that and uh, the, the questions and challenges that the Women Life Freedom Movement raised. 
Thank you, and I'll stop for now. Thank you so much, and thank you for being so structured and like so. Um, so uh, I'm inviting our last speaker. Um, probably Hungary is a bit of a different case because thanks. <laughs> Thanks, I don't know to whom uh, Zakarpatia is still a peaceful, relatively peaceful region. Um, but we, especially recently here from the Ukrainian perspective, we noticed how uh, Hungarian regime is uh, changing months by months and getting more and more tendencies, which, okay, on one hand, they... Uh, we see how damaging they are for Ukraine because Hungary is one of those countries who is not eager to support Ukrainian resistance. At the same time, we would like to know more uh, about what goes on inside the country and how is it connected to global tendencies. So, Chaba, floor is yours. Thank you so much, Iona. So, uh, well, as you know, and you also pointed out, like Hungary is a small country in Eastern Europe, actually, as you also pointed out, bordering Ukraine from the West. And it is totally uh, different to such a large and pow powerful uh, geopolitical players like Russia or Iran. Also at this point, I'd say Hungary uh, cannot be called authoritarian regime at this point the terminology is usually uh could be either flawed democracy or a hybrid regime so let's just go through uh how the current regime in hungary evolved and you know uh victor orban gave birth uh to this to this system that is currently running hungary so Orban and his Fidesz party has been in power now for almost uh, 14 years, but they also won an election back in 1998 as well. Regarding its evolution, well, that's a long story. I try to uh, explain as quickly as possible. Uh, during his high, high school years, Orban was a secretary of the a uh, local communist youth organization, but he wasn't a communist. He wanted to be in politics uh, from a very early age. Later, Orban studied law in Budapest and political science in Oxford, uh, which is an interesting case because this was funded by his current main international adversary, George Soros, Hungarian-American billionaire, uh, headed, head, head of the Open uh, Society Foundation. <clears throat> so in 1988, he founded his current political party, Fides, which is the name uh, acronym of Alliance of Young Democrats. He was part, then later, he was part of the uh, roundtable discussions that prepared the system or uh, let's say regime change in Hungary, as it was very, very clear at that time that the Soviet Union under Gorbachev was not a real threat anyone anymore in anywhere, basically in Eastern Europe or the former Eastern Bloc. Nevertheless, the system within was still quite repressive, but uh, let's say like Orban read the events very, very well. And his movement at that time, uh, later what became a political party, Fidesz, had a more radical liberal approach to politics than any other liberal movement or party at the time in Hungary. Uh, Fidesz called for still uh, within the socialist regime if we can call it socialist uh, by any means, but you know that's what the system was called at that time. So they called for the rule of law, parliamentary uh, democracy, anti-corruption, cultural diversity, uh, which might sound like a joke today if we think about what they've been doing in the last like almost 14 years. So moving on, getting closer to the uh, 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 the end of the 80s. In the summer of 1989, he gave a speech during the reburial of the martyrs of the 
anti-Soviet revolution, where he asked for free elections and withdrawal of Soviet troops from Hungary, which uh, got him into mainstream politics uh, domestically and internationally as well. And, uh, you know, thanks to this thanks to this speech, he managed to get into the first democratically elected parliament in 1990. His party got uh, 9% of the votes. The first democratically elected right-wing conservative government in just few years uh, basically became extremely unpopular because of its neoliberal economics that meant uh, privatization, high unemployment, high inflation that sent the governing uh, MDF party basically into disarray. And Orban just once again read the read what's happening very well as early as in 1993. So he saw that the governing right wing is destroying itself with its policies that started to create a, va a vacuum on the, on the right wing. At the same time, uh, his party became part of the liberal international where Orban actually was vice president until 2000. But even, even, even before that, after the second elections in 1994, Fidesz, his Orban's party, barely reached 5% threshold. And it was clear that they are the smaller liberal party to uh, another one, SDS. So it was time for Orban and his party to move on. So he started to transform his uh, liberal student group into a central right-wing political party, which, as you can imagine, caused the, uh, a, a really serious rift and a severe split in the party's membership. But nevertheless, uh, Orban believed in it and started to fill this vacuum on the right. And he did so well that he actually won the elections in 1998. So at that time, Orban's communication was quite blunt, let's say, like, or boring. He always, oh, he always called anyone opposing him a communist or almost like a Russian agent, and basically that was it. And nothing really happened during those years. Uh, I'm going to explain later uh, the NATO membership. Hungary was on the way becoming the, the member of the EU as well. But he lost the uh, next elections four years later. And everybody thought like Viktor Orban and his party, or at least Viktor Orban is basically, he was done. But the next two terms under socialist government in Hungary, uh, which adopted a more and more neoliberal uh, economic approach. And later, when in 2008, the financial crisis started, it was very much clear already that he, that he Orban, Viktor Orban, is coming back. And then, obviously, he won the elections in 2010, and he grabbed the power, and he won't release it anytime soon. So with uh, two-thirds of majority uh, that he won with, uh, he changed the playing field completely. Uh, he adopted a brand new constitution, uh, changed the judicial and electoral systems, made the public media basically a propaganda tool that never questions anything they do, essentially making Hungary a so-called flawed democracy, as I mentioned earlier, or a hybrid regime. That's more like the academia uh, terminology for Hungary nowadays. <clears throat> Orban actually uh, himself calls this, calls his system as a liberal democracy. He is absolutely uh, against the project of the United States of Europe. He always uh, mentioning that he prefers sovereignty within the EU. Uh, now the regime has the uh, following, following uh, main uh, enemies that they are always talking about, my, migration, uh, bureaucrats in Brussels, George Soros and all other NGOs that 
actually wants to hear about human rights situations and you know anti-corruption movements and they are or or he is basically put every uh everything that i just mentioned into one bracket uh and that's liberalism so this is what he is building here regarding the economy structure uh of of hungary nowadays so as you probably know, we are uh, a member of the European Union. Uh, Fidesz and Hungary now has uh, a corporate friendly capitalist system, uh, which over time started to favor domestic corporations, which could seem to be a positive thing coming from the left, obviously. And for some level, let's say it actually is. The problem is, uh, however, uh, that the extreme level of corruption uh, in Hungary that is basically taking place, uh, essentially, just to give you an example, uh, Viktor, Viktor Orban's best friend, uh, Lorenz Mészáros, a gas fitter uh, from his local village, Felchut, in just a few years uh, became Hungary's top oligarch and the richest person in the country. Uh, basically, he bought banks and created one big from them, buying up lands everywhere, uh, media organizations, football, team, football teams, uh, even outside of Hungary, energy, IT companies, and most interesting part is that basically most of the EU fundings were lending in his pockets as his corporations are usually winning all these projects uh, domestically. Uh, Hungary on the international economic uh, level is very much connected to Germany. That is the main reason that the EU has been complaining for years, but actually never did anything uh, to stop Hungary's political moves. Some heads of the German corporations uh, were actually bragging on European level that they can even call the Hungarian foreign minister during the night time if they want something, he's going to pick up the phone, listen and do what they want. Uh, just to give you an example, BMW, this huge automotive, automotive uh, corporation just a few years ago requested a new law from the government to raise the maximum overtime hours almost to double in a year which became known as a slavery law here. But other uh, German corporations aren't much better anyway. So we have like Audi, Mercedes, Volkswagen, Bosch, Siemens, you name it, uh, are making incredible profits in Hungary due to its cheap and skilled labor flexible labor laws, uh, I mean, not flexible for employees though. And the vast amount of profit is basically just transferred out from the country very, very easily and without any restrictions. So, you know, that's why it's not a big problem for Orban that basically these corporations are taking out everything that they are creating or the wealth that they are creating in Hungary because he's got enormous political support in exchange. And this uh, clearly shows that apparently the European Union itself is much more interested in uh, satisfying its corporate elites than its workers and or citizens. Uh, the EU Parliament, which highlights Orban's autocratic moves, is basically a toothless lion without any authority. Uh, in the last few years, however, it was, you know, uh, all the moves that the government was doing was even too much for the EU. And, you know, it started to take some actions withholding its funds to Hungary until it reverses the changes they did in so many fields. In the last few years, uh, regarding wars, and uh, you know, it's a difficult case also, but let's just put into geopolitical context what Hungary has been doing in the last few years. So in 1999, 
under the first Orban government, Hungary joined NATO, and we actively have the alliance to bomb Yugoslavia at that time. And but that didn't make him too popular. He also sent troops to Afghanistan uh, in 2001, which lasted for 20 years, and it was extremely costly for Hungary's economy. And at the end of the day, as you also probably know, it turned out to be totally pointless. Uh, in the 2000s, uh, Orban was still very much anti-Russia and he never felt safe from the East. At least that was he was talking about all the time. Uh, so in 2008, uh, that was a turning point. You know, Russia attacked Georgia and Orban was uh, very critical and even furious and wanted NATO to invite Georgia and Ukraine immediately into NATO because, as he pointed out, Russia just won't stop. And in this case, he was absolutely right. So in 2014, he called the invasion of Crimea an aggression and once again asked the EU to give Russia a strong response. Then what happened after 2014 to make uh, Hungary basically do an 80 degrees turn? So as I, as I explained earlier, Hungary follows Germany closely. Whatever Germany does, Orban follows. Orban thought that the economic sanctions against Russia were a joke and uh, the EU is not serious about helping Ukraine, especially you remember when the Minsk II agreement came into effect, Orban thought like, okay, uh, now we can do whatever we want, you know, we are just talking about putting into, putting some sanctions into effect, but, you know, that just basically won't stop Russia anyway. And there is actually a theory that he wanted to get close to Russia to build a relationship that would prevent Russian aggression against Hungary in the future, because at that time, everybody was talking about like the you know, the Russian aggression against Georgia a few years ago, then in Ukraine, and maybe he wants to rebuild the empire from the Baltic states to the, you know, former Eastern Bloc countries also. So later on, he agreed on big infrastructure deals with Russia, most notably the expansion of the Mm, Pox nuclear power plant here in Hungary. In the meantime, the EU has been complaining that Hungary started to move away from European values and being more autocratic. Now I thought like, okay, we need to be a more independent, open economic and political channels to the East as well. And he sped up his government's Eastern opening policy. The more connections, uh, more business deals, more engagement, brought new ideas, new strategies for Orban, who was still heavily criticized from the West that basically got him very close to Russia and China. And even though uh, he built his political career, as I explained, on anti-Russian and anti-communist sentiment. So this shows that he's extremely flexible uh, on many, many levels, domestically and internationally as well. So exploited, uh, he exploited the 2015's uh, refugee crisis also very well. Uh, you know, he started to put himself into his self-described savior of Christian Europe, which was too much for the EU, you know, especially to the liberal Western EU countries. Uh, but that actually, uh, and unfortunately, pushed him more and more to the East. So as he grew, close, grew closer to Putin, he started to complain more and more about the Hungarian minorities situation in Ukraine, most notably the, the language law, which made uh, Ukrainian language as almost like unique in all levels or fields except obviously like, uh, you know, personal conversations or religious uh, events. 
but of, but a year after Russia invaded Crimea and uh you know through its proxies uh they started this separatist war in Ukraine not so long later so just one year later uh, German Dutch Austrian companies made a big deal with Russia and Gazprom to build the the new pipeline connecting Nord Stream 2 connecting the connecting Germany and Russia uh, with cheaper and faster and quicker gas uh, coming into Europe. So for no, no, like one minute. <laughs> oh yeah, sorry. Okay, so <laughs> you know I still have like two like main uh, topics. So let's just start with or let's just finish it with the last one because i think that's the most interesting part like the if there is any achilles heel and where so you know as i said it's a hybrid regime uh in hungary the big problem is that the opposition is fragmented uh they are out of the public media and uh basically they are getting into parliament without doing anything uh because Orban's party is winning by two thirds majority anyway. So, you know, that's a good paying job at the end of the day. We don't really have too much for that. Uh what we would need, I think, uh from leftist perspective, I think uh there's supposed to be some grassroots movement coming from underground, basically uh educate the the workers students and you know trying to uh figure it out like there's supposed to be much more criticism just that Orban is a corrupt or a friend of dictators and you know there's supposed to be a movement uh which is built uh talking to talking to the workers and everybody else on the political spectrum because you know Hungary could be a wealthy country, but it's not a wealthy country because, you know, the very few uh, takes uh, so much amount of wealth from the 99%. And, you know, all grassroots movements should focus on this to change the uh, scene, uh, the political scene in Hungary. So uh, thanks a lot for your presentations and we are already getting questions uh, in the chat. So that's why I wanted to save more time for the discussion. And uh, please, we have like 20 minutes for questions. So dear listeners, please um, just type your questions uh, in the chat and I will read them. And the first question uh, is for Frida. Um, it's about the minorities. So uh, Kirill asks, uh, besides the Kurdish minority, what other ethnic groups are involved in the national democratic movement in Iran? And I will also re read other questions and then ask my question and then we are going to have a round. So the second question uh, goes to Ilya, a very interesting one. Uh, so there is a lot of talk about the potential of national minorities liberation movements in Russia. Uh, my impression, Oksana says, and I agree with her, <laughs> that uh, is that most of these talks can be categorized as wishful thinking. What is your opinion on this question? Uh, are these regions, are there regions where such movements can get some scale? and can or cannot display a role in fall of the regime. Uh, if cannot, then what uh, can play? And yeah, we unfortunately um, are in a situation where we need to be realistic when thinking about it, because of course, from our point of view, it seems that the only uh, actor which can oppose the regime are armed forces of Ukraine, but uh, is there still a hope for other actors? And uh, I wanted also to ask Chaba about, probably you could tell more on how the civil society in Hungary works, because, okay, on the news, we read how horrible uh, is Orban regime, 
At least Ukrainian news, they really love to criticize Orban regime. Finally, they, they started doing it because like before there was no, uh, you know, criticism to all of this right wing um, parties winning in uh, Eastern Europe. And but if we talk about civil society, I don't know, about students, about people who live in bigger cities, is there a difference in opinions? And also probably we could, you know, also try to somehow understand uh, Hungary comparing it to Russia and Iran, because Russia is an example of the regime where there is almost zero protest. And if the, if there is a protest, it does not really work. There is no like actor which opposes the regime. In Iran, we have a completely different situation where the revolution, um, every several years, it rises up and we see how the movement not taken into uh, like, even that there such horrible oppression of it, uh, it still goes on. So where could we place Hungary on this, I would say scale, or probably it's completely out of the scale. So yeah, please, uh, I think first Frida, then Ilya, then Chaba. Sure. So uh, in addition to the Kurdish struggle, which I mentioned, which is the most uh, significant, and that's where we had uh, um, the beginning of the woman life freedom movement with protests against the murder of uh, Gina Mahsa Amini for not wearing her hijab properly. Uh, there have been uh, struggles, continued struggles in uh, Khuzestan, which is in the south west uh, bordering Iraq, and in uh, Baluchistan, which is in the southeast uh, near Pakistan and Afghanistan. And both of those provinces, both Baluchistan and Khuzestan, are extremely poor. Uh, Baluchistan is the poorest. And the, 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 what was really significant, we had seen protests in Khuzestan over labor issues, over, as I mentioned, pollution, opposition to pollution and um, building of dams, which had, had also led to a, a water shortage um, and other uh, changes in the environment. But in Khuzestan, what was really uh, surprising in a very um, a progressive way was that with the rise of the Women Life Freedom Movement, we saw the emergence of a, a feminist uh, uh, struggle in, in Khuzestan, at least the feminist voice in Khuzestan, issuing statements, making clearly feminist demands and challenging the leadership uh, and uh, challenging misogyny in Iranian society as a whole and within uh, Baluchistan. So um, those are all really very promising. And uh, I won't say much more because we don't have time. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you. So um, the first thing to say is uh, that during uh, all the years of Putin's regime, there was the process of defederalization of the country, which uh, means not only limitation of uh, power on on the regions and especially uh, in the uh, in the so-called republics yeah the the uh, regions where uh, where the various uh, national minorities <clears throat> um, uh, lived in Russia uh, but uh, also uh, this federalization uh, process means uh, the uh, systematic suppression of all uh, sorts of um, uh, regional national movements. So that's why you can't say that there is any, <clears throat> in any uh, national region of Russia, you have some uh, strong tradition of the, uh, of the national movement. Uh, so, uh, but that doesn't mean that uh, there are no any uh, sort of uh, anti-Moscow, anti-centralist, or even anti-Russian uh, sentiments uh, in uh, some of these 
uh, regions, especially after the beginning of uh, of the invasion of uh, Ukraine, and you know that uh, the national minorities from uh, some of these uh, regions they um, uh, they were uh, presented in the in the front line. Uh, um, a lot, and uh, there are a lot of people um, who who were in the army uh, from these uh, regions died already, uh, and of course it, it it provokes some some sort of uh, feelings, some sort of uh, sentiments, uh, especially because this war is uh, mostly designed as the war for the great russia is the war for the russian world and uh, sometimes of course it's not clear why the people who are not not russians uh, should fight for the uh, for the russian uh, for the russian war but uh, you you can say that uh, you have this uh, sentiments uh, and these feelings uh, um, exist in some form of the organized uh, movement. But I think that uh, we should uh, look at this question uh, in a more broad uh, framework because, generally speaking, the Russian uh, regime is, uh, is, is fragile in, in many ways. And the um, uh, so called uh, mutiny of uh, Wagner, uh, this um, Wagner group, this uh, summer is, is a good example of, of, of this uh, fragility. Uh, and uh, I think that, let's say, realistically, uh, the uh, possible uh, crisis or possible fall of this regime will come as the uh, as the um, uh, sort of activation of the various um, contradictions that exist inside this uh, regime. So I, I think that probably it could be uh, some uh, some conflict uh, on, on the top, some sort of um, um, split in the elites that uh, will activate many other contradictions in the Russian society, such as, such as um, a huge social inequality and, uh, of course, the, uh, the uh, situation with the national minorities. Uh, ah, there, there is another question for, uh, for me. Yeah, yeah, please go on and then... Uh, do, do you think there is a chance uh, of uh, countrywide grassroots solidarity sparked by the minority movements within uh, Russia? So it's 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 very hard to <laughs> predict how it will look like because, <clears throat> for for example, I don't know if you follow the Russian news. Uh, there was the uh, kind of massive anti-Semitic action in the uh, Republic of uh, Dagestan, uh, in the in the North uh, Caucasus, where some uh, around 2,000 people, uh, they block the airport in uh, uh, in in Mahachkala, in the in the in the capital of this uh, region, and they were searching uh, for uh, Jews uh, to to lynch them. So that was the main uh, program of this movement, <clears throat> and this movement was uh, mostly um, organized uh, by the Telegram channel. Uh, uh, with very strange kind of origins, but uh, this telegram channel, uh, which, which is called Morning of Dagestan, uh, is, uh, is 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 a is Islamist uh, channel. So they they use uh, the kind of Islamic uh, slogans, uh, and their <clears throat> their anti-Semitism was designed in in the. Uh, sort of uh, jihadist war uh, against uh, against the enemies, but uh, the interesting thing was that this uh, this action was probably the biggest grassroots movement in Russia during the uh, past uh, year. And uh, what is interesting that uh, if you look carefully to the propaganda of this. Um, 
uh, this morning of uh, Dagestan, uh, you can uh, see how the anti-Semitic rhetoric uh, somehow includes the elements of the anti-Russian uh, rhetoric as well. Uh, so uh, basically, I see that uh, in this region, in in the north northern uh, Caucasus, the uh, the kind of realistic possibility of some sort of of uh, grassroots movement can uh, can go in this uh, in the, in this way, uh, especially in the situation where uh, uh, the let's say radical Islamist uh, tradition is the only uh, kind of tradition uh, of self-organization of uh, uh, like political expression uh, that uh, still exists in this uh, region and uh, somehow rooted in some parts of the of the society there so uh, that's why for for the moment I I, I, I don't see the the ground for the countrywide grassroots uh, solidarity uh, but of course, I, I, I wish it could uh, happen someday. Double, please. Yes, so I tried to remember uh, all the questions that were put into one or two sentences. So regarding civil society, so, and, you know, the system is basically in that point of view could be easily changed, like the elections are free. The problem is the you know, the level of propaganda and the, the fragmentation of the opposition that I already mentioned. But the civil society is mostly free to do whatever they want to do, but they are also very much disorganized. So, for example, in the last few months, there has been a quite large uh, protests, mostly coming from the teachers' associ associations, uh, because, you know, Teachers, especially teachers, are the most underpaid, uh, you know, employees of the state. So basically, they are living off usually four or five hundred euros a month, which basically wouldn't be enough to survive here in the capital city just to pay rent, to say the least. So there are some uh, protests. Civil society also can take part of it. Problem is, however. So the government and its tools, the media tools, the propaganda tools, they are always single out the organizers of the protesters that they are find something in the background, what they did like, I don't know, 20 years ago. And they are keep, you know, trying to inject these, you know, unrelated informations to their voters' minds. So basically, that's how they are killing of any kind of movement movement coming from from grassroots the other problem also that the opposition which has no credibility whatsoever always jumps on these protests and they are going around and you know showing their uh you know party flags and whatsoever so the government is basically also do the same mixing up the two like look the protesters are communists that's what they are actually trying to convene as a message to their voters so eventually everybody is going to be like okay uh, let's just screw this we don't want to do this anymore because what what's the point so you can do fr things freely but you know you are just against a huge machine that never sleeps and it's always against you. So that's why I think it's at the end of the day, it's very much demoralizing for, for anybody who wants to do something larger from coming from civil society. Uh, regarding the, the bigger cities that you've been asking, asked about, so for example, Budapest, the capital city is in opposition hands. So the mayor and most of the uh, districts are also in opposition hands. So you can, in terms of Ukraine, can see much more solidarity sometimes. So, you know, there were like streets uh, close to the Danube rename for uh, Kyiv uh, just uh, recently. And you can see graffitis about Slava Ukraine even close to my, uh, you know, street where I live now. I just saw it a couple of days ago. So there are some artist movements which uh, brought the issue of Ukraine also. You can, I just went to a restaurant a couple of days ago and it was, uh, 
you know, fuck the war and, you know, Russians out and stuff like that. Uh, you've written in Russian also. So, you know, there is absolutely different approaches coming from, from, from a bigger city, obviously, where the majority lives, actually. And but you know it's the the government and how it's built and in that sense it's I said like it's very much different uh, Hungary very much different than to Russia to to Iran, but in terms of uh, you know executive level like what you have President Putin in in Russia or or Khamenei Ayatollah in Iran. At the end of the day, they are making all the big decisions. And this is the case also for Hungary. So even though we have uh, civil society to do whatever they want, we have free elections. But still, whatever uh, a bigger uh, question comes into the picture, Orban is going to execute uh, the, the, the last. He's He has the last words, basically. So in terms, uh, could be very looked at very similarly. Yeah, and could you um, ask the question you wrote in the chat yourself, so I do not read your words? Oh, yeah. Then... So, yeah, so I, I wanted to ask Frida first about Iran, because you said like uh, economics, extreme economic situation could destabilize Iran from within. I mean, like that could be also part of the, 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 at the end of the regime in Iran. But... Iran is under the heaviest economic sanctions for since 1979. So what is that level that you can imagine that could be actually deadly for the Iranian regime? Thank you. Uh, do you want me to answer now? Yeah. yeah. So uh, that was one of the factors. I, I certainly didn't mean that that would be the only factor. And I mean, we have had uh, extreme economic hardships of the masses in the, since 2018. Uh, so that by itself will not do it. But I meant that in, in uh, when can taken into consideration along with uh, issues of environmental degradation and opposition to misogyny and uh, discrimination against national minorities. But uh, most important, I, I think, about Iran is that we have had some really progressive movements. We have had the, uh, the demands of the women life freedom movement have been extremely progressive and very internationalist. And they've also received support from labor struggles, from the national minorities. They've included the demand for the recognition of LGBTQ uh, community, which is for the Middle East is really amazing and also for abortion and reproductive rights. So that is what I see as this, the hope for Iran, that those struggles will survive and continue. But economic crisis by itself will not do it. I mean, the best example is North Korea. I don't think you can get any worse than North Korea. And yet the Kim uh, Jong-il regime is still in, in power. So. Thank you. Yeah. Um, oh, um, okay, Oksana has another question for Chaba, but I think she did not write it. Uh -huh. Okay, so um, another question uh, about Hungary. Some scholars talk about churchification of Hungary. Um, so more churches. I don't know if I read the word in the right way, like churchification. Mm -hmm. um, what does it mean in terms of political trajectory, like the religious aspect? Yes. So uh, there is a really interesting story just from last summer when Orban was actually talking about Antonio Gramsci, the founder of the Communist Party of Italy, and about the uh, creating a uh, a cultural hegemony or hegemony, I'm not sure how to pronounce this word uh, correctly. And this is, uh, you know, creating churches, talking about Christian values became part of that. So it, it started to overtake the discourse 
in Hungary. Obviously, especially in big cities, this creates uh, you know, rejection uh, from, from people who has access to information. Uh, but in the countryside, you know, it it's uh, it it became uh, like uh, basically the only thing to do for many communities. I would say to go to the church. Churches are not being built that much as stadiums. That's Orban's favorite uh, thing to do anyway. But the general consensus in especially in the countryside and for older generation is basically the lack of access to information uh access to the lack of access to any uh you know social life the church is the only thing where people could go because there is basically nothing it's the whole countryside especially around the ukrainian border it it is deserted old people living in like you know, the young people move to bigger cities, there is basically nothing else. And that's why, you know, people need some kind of, I don't know, utopias like religion itself. So, you know, the whole religious approach is being reinvented in Hungary. And, you know, that's, you know, obviously not a, a could be part of the, uh, the progressive uh, movements, unfortunately, but that's that's the case. Like it's part of the plan to create this uh, cultural environment where Christian um, religion, traditional values, is just uh, part of the the big picture. And you know, if the public discourse come comes into this environment, you know, obviously people are not gonna talk about anything else because it's just going to be a, a closed environment and not to mention also religious leaders are usually very close to Orban's party so basically it's it's not a rare case especially before elections that you know priests are actually talking about that you have to go to vote and vote for for the current government otherwise it's not going to be good for uh, religious rights, which is absolutely unfounded claims, but still works somehow, especially if you consider that they control the mass media anyway. Yeah, uh, we have more detailed uh, questions from Oksana, but unfortunately, Oksana, um, yeah, let's discuss it probably another time with Chaba. Uh, anyway, we are in touch uh, because yeah it's time to wrap up and i want to thank you um Ilya, frida chaba for your participation thanks for waking up so early <laughs> and also chaba thanks for being here it's evening um yeah um we will have uh, an article on our website about uh, our meeting also the youtube i mean the video will be on youtube both in english and in ukrainian in english i i, I think it's going to be like from now on but in ukrainian we will upload it later and uh, now i'm gonna switch to ukrainian to say the final thank you um ta drugi druzi podruge Дякуємо, що були з нами ці два дуже інтенсивних дні. Нам вдалося провести ці прекрасні шість зустрічей, поговорити, познайомитись. Та дякую, що продовжуєте бути зі спільним. Цей рік для нас, як для багатьох в Україні, був дуже складним, але ми продовжуємо. Нагадаю, що крім статей на нашому сайті є подкасти, на нашому ютуб-каналі є відео. Будь ласка, продовжуйте слідкувати за нами. Та, і наостанок хочу подякувати, крім спікерів і спікерок, дуже хочу подякувати організаторкам, моїм колегам, перекладачам. Окремо дякую. Це було неймовірно. Ви зробили дуже складну роботу і дуже добре. І та, всім, хто долучився, ем, до нових зустрічей на сторінках журналу «Спільне».